good to be here with you all. I look forward to being there in person soon. Book is sort of close, narrowing in maybe two to three weeks away. Uh, then I send it off to the uh, publisher. So then I'll be more free to do other things, to have a life <laughs> and to come to San Francisco on Wednesdays. So I look forward to that. Um, I am hearing some noise. I'm wondering if that's the room or Jason. Yeah. Uh, maybe Great. Unmuted. Th thanks all. No problem. It happens. Unmuting happens. Um, and so... So that just happened. How long have I been talking without any <laughs> sound? That's four, four sentences at most. Okay. <laughs> um, so I was, that. that's happened before, I think that, um, yeah. Maybe if the mute button occurs for one, it can occur for me too from time to time if we're both co-hosts. In any case, yeah, I'm just happy to be with you and look forward to coming in person when I can get over to the uh, San Francisco Dharma Collective in person when my book is turned in, hopefully early November, and I uh, can get on with my life. <laughs> so, it's okay, Jason, no problem. <laughs> At least I didn't do it and then keep talking. <laughs> that would be really embarrassing. Okay, so we're going to practice first off. We are continuing with Boundless Healing. Um, it's a very interesting book. We're going to cover Chapter 4 tonight pretty briefly. It's, it's straightforward. It lays down some basic ideas about just the power of the mind and the body and how it can be honed. The, the mind really can be used to help the body heal and vice versa, actually. And then... So tonight what I'll do is start off the evening with, uh, we'll do shamatha as a grounding practice, concentration and relaxation. And then the last half or so will be a guided practice on visualizing the body. So we're f building a capacity, a foundation and a framework and a capacity to use visualization and mindfulness to help direct our attention towards healing. And so the meditation that I'll offer you towards the end of the longer sit is found in his practice chapter, part two, where he lays out different techniques. And uh, you'll get a sense of, of what he means by bringing the mind into the body and using the mind to visualize different parts of the body to then later enhance health, energy, and so on. Okay, so why don't you go ahead and take a comfortable seat or supine if you prefer. Make sure you're comfortable and all your notifications are turned off so that you can relax and not uh, swim up water against the current of already a pretty challenging project, which is to release distraction. So here we go. Fasten your seat belts. <laughs> we'll sit for about maybe 35, 40 minutes. So let's take a moment to settle in with our eyes closed, take some deep breaths. It's always nice to Give yourself a little bit of leeway here in the first few moments of meditation to make sure that you really are feeling that you have what you need to then hold the practice in stillness as much as possible. I find this to be true. It's something my early meditation teachers taught me, which is that if you begin your session, if you start off on a good footing, Meaning that if you can start off with clarity and a very uh, f committed approach to detecting distraction, 
drifting early on, then you're more likely to be able to sit free of distraction as time progresses. Whereas if you start kind of foggy, lackadaisical, then it's harder to regain clarity after that beginning. Okay, so let's go ahead and just take a moment to settle in, take some deep breaths. Give rise to your heartfelt motivation for practice. Bodhicitta. If you wish, you can take the bodhicitta mudra. The two middle fingers pointing up, the other fingers folded across each other, symbolizing the single-pointed intention to awaken for the benefit of all beings. And then releasing the hands and take a few moments to sift down into how you're feeling right now. What's true? What's here? Are you a little rushed? Are you a little tired? Aches and pains or feeling quite at ease? Just acknowledging what's true. And giving yourself the space to really be here as you are. Now become aware of the breath. Notice the quality of the breath, if it's flowing freely or feels a little hindered. See if you can release any tension around the breath itself. Perhaps there's tightness around the belly or kidneys. Soften the belt line. Let the diaphragm descend as you inhale, ascend as you exhale. Feeling the lungs and the rib cage expand and release with each breath. Melting any tension or tightness in the breathing apparatus. Feel the throat relaxed. And let the breath settle in its natural rhythm. Release control of it. Bring the tip of the tongue to rest against the upper palate, right at the root of the top front teeth. The chin drawn in a bit, lengthening the back of the neck, the shoulders relaxed down, the facial muscles relaxed, the jaw goes slack, breathing through the mouth or nose. The arms, legs relaxed. The hands can be resting on your lap, palms down on the thighs. And then really commit to holding the position as still as possible. When the body is still, the mind has a greater chance of settling and being still as well. We'll spend some time with a simple gati, a phrase that the Buddha offered for shamatha, calm abiding practice. And you can say it internally to yourself quietly, silently, attending to the whole body. I breathe in, attending to the whole body. I breathe out. Releasing distraction with the out-breath. Committing to really being here with yourself. Cultivating concentration amidst relaxation. Attending to the whole body, I breathe in. Attending to the whole body, I breathe out.
from the crown of the head to the soles of the feet, feel the global experience of being in your body with the breath in the moment, not drifting off into fantasy or regret or rumination. Release that if it arises and settle back into the gati, attending to the whole body, I breathe in, attending to the whole body, I breathe out. Thus one trains. Attending to the whole body, I breathe in. Attending to the whole body, I breathe out.
And then shifting now to the next gati, soothing the field of the body, I breathe in. Soothing the field of the body, I breathe out. The field of the body is the arena, the full field of tactile sensations. Again, the global experience, but also the field of vibration, stagnancy, heat, cold. Soothing any kind of discomfort or not or tension. Just let the mind and the breath and the words soothe the field of the body. I breathe in. Soothing the field of the body, I breathe out. Let that wash over you, embody it. Repeating the phrase internally as a mindfulness anchor. Soothing the body, breathe in. Soothing the body, breathe out. Thus one trains. Soothing the field of the body, I breathe in. Soothing the field of the body, I breathe out.
And now for the next phase of the shamatha, now we release the focus on the breath. Let it fade into the background. And allow the eyes to gently open and settle the mind in its natural state. Now taking the mind itself as the object of attention, as the anchor of shamatha, meaning the domain of the mind itself. That space within which thoughts, feelings, ruminations arise and pass. That space that is not changed by the appearances that arise within it. Just like that of space. Just like the day and night appearances change in the sky, the space itself does not change. Likewise, the mind, space of the mind is unchanged by the colors, the memories, the thoughts that arise and pass within it. So rest in that experience, observing the domain, the, mu the space of the mind, free of grasping, free of distraction. Releasing distraction with the outbreath, releasing grasping with the outbreath. Settle the mind in its natural state. Soften the gaze. Let the gaze be vacant, a lantern consciousness rather than spotlight consciousness. Diffuse, limpid, cool pools of water. The eyes. Resting in stillness. From time to time, if you need to blink, please do so. Rest the eyes and open them again. And soften the gaze at a downward angle towards the floor.
then gently allow the eyes to close, yet without losing that quality of awareness, the space of the mind, anchored in stability and relaxation. And now we'll shift into a different mode of meditation where we're actually using the mind to transform the mind, this aspect of discursive meditation, as opposed to non-discursive meditation, like what we were just doing and settling the mind in its natural state. So the purpose of this meditation is to bring you closer into closer contact with your body. When your mind is connected intimately to your body, then healing is more able to permeate you. And you have an open channel for positive energy. And the healing you call upon in other meditations on the body will become stronger and more powerful. Let's make sure everybody is muted. Jason, if you could make sure. Okay, I did it. So now with your mind's eye, begin to scan your body. Slowly and gently see that the anatomical details of your body come into focus part by part. But try to see them clearly without strain to the extent of your anatomical knowledge. So you're not trying to see the body as beautiful or ugly, but just as it is. So relax and feel serenity in your body. We'll be contemplating the body from head to feet. So first, with your mind's eye, scan the details of your head. See that your head is made of a skull and brain. Feel the scalp. And see the sense organs as best as you can. And when we say see, we mean in your mind's eye. See, even sense and feel, the sense organs, the eyes, with their pupils through which you see forms. If you can see the eyes themselves. The nose with its nostrils through which you smell odors. the ears with their ear canals through which you hear sounds, the tongue with which you taste food, the teeth and jaws the mouth which enables you to eat and speak, see the facial muscles, the nerves and the arteries, all the parts of the head covered with skin and hair. And see your whole head as it is. And now with your mind's eye, scan your neck and see your throat 
then the larynx and vocal cords. If you don't know what these things look like, you can feel them, imagine them, generally, their location. In your mind's eye, if you can, see the esophagus leading into the stomach. The trachea through which you breathe. See the skin covering it all. Now scan your upper body and see the spine and the spinal cord. Maybe you've seen an x-ray. See the spine. Maybe the clavicle, the collarbone. The shoulder blades. The sternum and rib cage. You might even see the rib cage, the sternum expanding and releasing with the breath, like a balloon expanding. And then releasing. Then scan the windpipe, which leads down to the lungs and see the soft, spongy lung tissue, the lung tissue which oxygenates the blood and removes carbon dioxide. See the heart, which pumps blood through your body with its system of arteries. And bring a sense of awareness to the nerves and vessels of this part of the body, the flesh and blood all covered with skin. Scan your arms and hands. See the bones of the upper arms. The elbows, the forearms, the wrists and hands. the fingers, as well as the marrow within the bones. Mm -hmm. 
see the muscles, nerves, and blood vessels with blood coursing through them, all covered with skin. Then scan the internal organs and bones in the area of your abdomen. If you can't visualize all the details, then just focus mostly on the major parts, such as the backbone, the pelvic bones, the stomach, the kidneys, the lower back, the adrenals that sit on top of the kidneys, the intestines, your liver sits on the right with the gallbladder beneath it, the stomach to the left, and the spleen farther to the left. And the pancreas in the middle. And a little footnote, if there are any aspects, any body parts that you no longer have, you can either just imagine as you are now, or you can imagine how you were before that aspect of your body perhaps was taken out. See the loops of the small intestine. The large intestine going up right across the top of the abdomen and then down the left side. Again, the kidneys which filter the blood and the adrenal glands just atop the kidneys and large intestine with their regulatory functions our little battery packs in our body. And then bring your awareness to the urinary bladder. And then to the male or female genitals And then internally, the ovaries and uterus, or the prostate gland. And see the nerves and vessels of this part of the body. See the muscles and connective tissue all covered with skin. And then scan your legs and feet. See the femurs, the thigh bones, the largest bones in your body where the most blood is created in the marrow. Down through the knee, the tibia, the fibula, the lower leg bones, 
through the ankle into the feet and toes. Even see the bone marrow within these bones. And see the muscles and nerves and blood vessels of your legs and feet covered in skin. And then scan your lymph nodes, which are part of the immune system and are clustered at such strategic points as the neck, the armpits, and the groin. And now look at your whole body. You may even feel it as one connective web of fascia, connective tissue. Skin, muscle, ligament, tendon to bone, all of it is made of connective tissue. And if it's like the mycelia of the body. Feel, see that your body is made of bones and organs and muscles, circulatory systems for blood and then for lymph fluid. It's an incredible system of bodily structures and organs and various fluids. And see that they're all wrapped in the skin with the tiny pores and the little hairs. See that the heart is pumping blood through every part of the body. Blood that circulates through thousands of arteries and veins, carrying oxygen and nutrients and getting rid of waste. The lymph system with its vessels also permeates the body, producing disease-fighting lymphocytes, which are filtered in the lymph nodes. And your exceedingly complex body parts are vibrantly functioning as one organism because of the circulating energy carried by the breath. As you breathe, feel your life's breath flowing through the body. Think and feel that you have seen all the details of your body just as they are. Think and feel that you have seen your whole body just as it is. And finally, enjoy the awareness of the vivid details of your body, your whole body, just as it is. And 
and feel serenity, ease and comfort in the vivid awareness of your body. And we'll close our session by dedicating the merit of the practice for the benefit of our healing, for the healing of those around us, for the healing of the whole world. Thank you. So, you might not even want to come back from that. I don't know. <laughs> I don't want to make you. <laughs> that was uh, quite a journey, and love to explore that with you. And I'm curious how that felt for you. And then I will also want to touch on some topics that he, the author, Tolku Tundup, uh, touches on in the fourth chapter, which is the chapter we're on, which is on um, page of the English version would be page 48, Realizing the Potential to Heal. But coming out of the meditation, feel free to raise your hand or chat in a question if you have anything you'd like to share or ask. I see Walt has a picture of a kitty cat. I wonder... Okay, you have gloves on Walt in that picture and I'm wondering if you're a veterinarian or if you're fostering cats <laughs> which my kid is doing right now you don't have to answer maybe you're not even able to but that's a really cute picture so how was the what 
lately we've been doing shamatha where we'll do the phrases. You know, we spend about 10 minutes with the first phrase and 10 minutes with the second phrase. And then 10 minutes or so with the settling the mind in its natural state version of shamatha, which takes the mind as the object of attention. And then, then I offered this guided practice of getting to know yourself <laughs> and getting to know your body. How was that for you, visualizing the body or really anything? It's, it's, it might have been kind of like, oh, whoa, we're doing this? What is, oh, I have to visualize my blood and lymph and intestines. And that was my, when I first did this, I was a little bit like, hmm, I don't, mm, this feels a little, hmm. But then the really wonderful sense of um, focus uh, came over me personally, but uh, that might not be everybody's experience. Go ahead, Jason, did you unmute? Yeah, I just wanted to say uh, thank you. And I don't think I've ever done a body scan like that ever. <laughs> or that was like the most yeah. body scan. And yeah, it was a little bit difficult at first because I was imagining myself as like a Grey's Anatomy cadaver or something. I had this weird, yeah, intense sort of sense of my own body that way. And then I and then I kind of had to let go of that. Mm -hmm. But that was that was an interesting interesting kind of mind over body experience because it felt I felt just like investigating something I hadn't really mm -hmm. done before so I just wanted to share that yeah it, it was deep and I can't say it was easy but it um it it's something I want to do more of because yeah I think what it made me realize is like oh I, I want to take care of this body yeah you know, that there was a lot of seeing like oh these things are happening and i'm not even paying attention i want to take care of my body so i just that that's my first impression of it yeah in, in a way it was educational for me too oh right the lymph creates lymphocytes and filtered through the lymph nodes oh right we need to take care of the lymph Lymph massage, self massage. You know, you could watch YouTube videos of how to do self massage where you just do gentle lymph drainage massage techniques, stuff like that. You know, ways to actually care for the body. But also, you can see, right, Jason, and other people too, how this is setting you up for doing more specific healing visualization, say, if you have particular needs, right? The marrow, the blood the different organs. And then if you don't have Gray's Anatomy detailed visualization, you could look at the book in this really cute, charming picture that's very simplistic. I got a kick out of this. I thought it was pretty funny. He offers that as, as just a basic, you know, you can look at this, sorry. You can look at it before you do the visualization if it helps you. <laughs> but, um, Again, it's not about doing it perfectly or seeing the body as perfect or beautiful or ugly. It's just seeing what, what is and also training the mind to be in the body. It is a form of body scan, especially I think, Jason, you mentioned last time, was it you? No, it was Bill. Bill J mentioned that he had a history with Vipassana practice. And there's a very common, especially Goenka, that does the body scan where you start from the top like honey dripping down the body you visualize, but it's a different, it's different than what we did. Yeah. So anybody else? Nick said, excellent detailed body scan. Great. Walt said, SPCA shelter med treatment shift. Great. That's wonderful. Hmm. <laughs> You could visualize the kitty body. <laughs> oh yeah, Rose, is, Rose asks, what's the difference between placing the hands, palms down, or I got, I got your, I caught your drift here, up or down? That's a good question. Um, that's something I learned a long time ago through my meditation training, but also yoga training. You know, mudra, hand positions, body positions will affect the mind. And 
the energy in different ways. And so you could test it out for yourself to see if this is true for you. But what I learned and what I found is pretty congruent is that when we rest with the palms down, it helps to ground the energy. It helps to ground the attention, ground the mind into the body. When we rest with the palms open, it's uplifting. There's a buoyancy, a upward feeling with that. So depending on how you feel, you could do one or the other, right? So if you're feeling agitated and the mind's flying all over the room, all over outer space, then palms down can help you come down for a landing. Whereas if you're feeling dull or lethargic, heavy, tired, you could turn the palms up and feel if that helps lift the energy, lifts the attention a bit. Um, Dzogchen meditation, it's very classic. You sit with the legs in just an easy cross-legged position, not lotus, not complicated, not like Burma style where you knees are wider with the heels in front of each other. You know, there are all sorts of different wonderful positions. This isn't better or worse, but the simple cross-legged position, like you're sitting on the floor with your legs crossed, not fancy, and then palms down on the thighs. That's just a natural, simple, uncomplicated, unyogically complex meditation seat that's very commonly used in Dzogchen, the great perfection teaching of Tibetan Buddhism that Eve and I are primarily trained in. So that's what I mainly teach. But there are also the Tibetans also use different positions for different uses. The other very common mudra is this mudra of meditative or single-pointed equipoise, or meditative equipoise, I mean. So the left hand will support the right, and then the thumbs are touching, and then that's resting in your lap. I find that I like to have a, a pillow or a blanket folded on my lap so I can rest my hands in a good way, because the idea is that you have a bit of a rounding through the arms, a little space breathing underneath the, the armpits, so you're not closed it's more of an open you know more I'm exaggerating here but you know so if I don't have a blanket handy then I'd like to just rest with my palms down but it's good to try a few different things and see what works for you okay anybody else okay Maria welcome first time here great uh, the first time holding the softened gaze for any prolonged period, yes. I found it pleasantly challenging, and I found myself just wanting to have eyes wide open with a softened gaze, if that makes any sense. Uh huh. Just clear, open awareness outward and observing the mind with clarity feels really good. That's wonderful. You have a natural proclivity for that. Absolutely, actually. The different meditations focus in different at different levels, right? So this gently... Um, Angle downwards is usually kind of the, the first introductory level. Um, it's usually how the Buddha is depicted. That's his instructions of resting the gaze past the level of the nose at an angle towards the floor. And so that's common so that you minimize distractions. But if distractions aren't an issue and you are find that you're drawn to just having the eyes more kind of along the horizon line, level with your own eyes, that's great, too. That's actually called the bodhisattva gaze. There's the arhat gaze, which is down, the bodhisattva gaze, which is straight ahead, and the haruka gaze, which is upward. <laughs> These different um, versions of the eye positions that you can use. And I like that bodhisattva gaze. It, it, for me, it means I'm in the world. You know, I'm looking around. I am relating to the world with compassion, with an open heart, like a bodhisattva would. And, uh, and and I'm practicing meditating at all times, not just when my eyes are closed or downcast or am I alone uh, when I'm alone in the room, but when I'm like talking to you, you're listening to me, we're in the market and so on. We can bring meditative attention into our life more readily when we're used to meditating with the eyes open. It dissolves the illusion of the inner and the outer duality. They say like the, the, the cave of duality collapses. <laughs> it's, it's, it's an illusion. Yeah, so I'm glad you, you had a natural 
a natural experience with that. Um, you're actually, it's quite rare in my experience, teaching Dharma, teaching meditation, especially being from the Tibetan tradition where they meditate with their eyes open a lot, as opposed to Burma, Thailand, other um, Theravadan traditions tend to do it with the eyes closed, mostly, not all the time. So if I'm teaching people who mainly have that background, it can be hard for them to get used to meditating with the eyes open. But also brand new beginners or other people like from the yogic tradition who are used to meditating with their eyes closed. So it can be hard. So I'm glad it was easy for you. I think just word to the wise for everybody here, if you're still finding it challenging, just give it time. You'll, you'll grow to get used to it and actually almost like long for it. Sometimes I even like thirst for it. Like there's the eyes get thirsty for it. <laughs> okay. But always let yourself rest. Blink if you need to. Rest the eyes for a few moments and then gently open them again. Sometimes if it's a dry season or allergy season, I'll have a little um, eye drops, like homeopathic eye drops in my purse. Sometimes at Tara Mandala we do a lot of sky gazing, and that's when we do the Haruka gaze. We gaze upwards a bit into space, the blue sky. And um, sometimes the pollen season, it, I wouldn't feel itchy, but my eyes would get dry. And I'd look in the mirror after we'd meditate, and I'd be bloodshot red. <laughs> it just looked terrifying. So then I would put eye drops in and that helped a bit. <laughs> that doesn't happen much, very often. Depends on what's in the air. Tara Mandala has gray sky gazing weather because it's southwest Colorado, high desert. They have 300 days out of the year of blue sunny skies, even when there's snow on the ground. I miss it. I haven't been there in a while. Time to go back. Okay. That's a retreat center that I work at, that I work through, that I work for, teach for. Founded by Lama Tsultra Malioni. Who's having her 75th birthday celebration online. Tara Mandala is doing a big fun event with musicians and stories and teachings and uh, it's a fundraiser as well it's her 75th birthday i'll be helping to host it i can share more about that it's on november 5th i think it's a tuesday saga uh, dawa duchen or labap duchen the, the one of the holy days of the buddhist calendar and the buddha descended from the heavens after teaching to his mother for three months <laughs> what a good son went to heaven to teach her Dharma. Thank you, M Maria, for offering that. Welcome, and I hope you come again. Anyone else before I touch on a few of the points of the chapter before we close? Okay. All right, so... So... Tokutunda is really setting us up for success in terms of understanding why the mind is a good tool for healing instead of, you know, always relying on outer objects like medicines, doctors, people, and so on. Of course, we need that. I need that. We all need that, too. But we mustn't forget the mind and what role the mind can play in healing. He first starts out the chapter... Chapter 4, page 48, by talking about three states of health. He, these are kind of foundational, simple, straightforward things, but they're nice to touch on. We have the unhealthy state where we spend our lives embroiled in sensations of pain, fear, sadness, confusion, and darkness. The mind and body trapped in a constant cycle of desire and aversion. The state is, needs to be healed, right? So that's the unhealthy state. The healthy state is where we feel peace and happiness. Um, this experience is sustained. Um, we should enjoy our healthy mind and body and bring a healing approach to our lives so that problems don't overwhelm us. But even though we have this healthy state, as long as we're subject to duality of conceptual existence, you know, good, bad, right, wrong, time and space, <laughs> aging, you, you name it, peace and turmoil, joy and pain, birth and death, we're not yet in a, in a perfectly liberated, healthy state, right? Which is fine. But then 
he says there's the third, the state of perfect health. We experience ultimate peace of mind that goes beyond the concepts of pain or happiness. So this is sort of a spiritual health, but what they say, the wisdom tradition says, is that when the mind is liberated, when duality, the cave of duality collapses and we're no longer stuck in hope and fear, there's a natural... Um, um, equanimity, peace, balance that comes over us and we experience this sort of ex experience of perfect health um, encompasses so-called opposites in a state of harmony. I thought that was interesting. In which we accept life joyfully just as it is. And in this enlightened state, it is possible to enjoy all situations in their true nature without needing to avoid or hold anything onto anything. Now that... Sounds like a pie in the sky to a lot of us because we don't have a lot of role models, <laughs> you know. We're not living in times where masters were yogis and yoginis were meditating up in the valleys where we could go take a hike one afternoon and go sit at the feet of these wisdom beings and see what sustained perfect health might look like, right? So it seems like a far-fetched thing, but I want to propose to all of us that we we oh, we maintain an open mind. Maybe you've even met such a being, but we maintain that this is possible, even though we might not have met someone like that in our life, that they have existed, they can exist, and it might even be us one day. <laughs> Okay, so those are these three states, pretty simple. Then he talks about like different healing objects that we can focus on in our path to healing. And just as a kind of background, you know, if you're new today, tonight or you haven't been reading the book or coming to class consistently, this book, Boundless Healing, he acknowledges that it's not a classic Dharma book where we're focused more on enlightenment. He's really focusing on meditative practices that can help us gain health, well-being, satisfaction, happiness in the body, healthy. So he's focusing on health in this book. But he does drop Dharma teachings from time to time, of course. So the four healing objects include the positive objects, such as like... Um, we can take our own body to be a positive object for healing meditations. We can imagine we have bodies, a body of light and filled with healing energies. That can be a helpful support. Uh, we can also, for example, think of an open boundless sky or anything from nature like a river or a mountain or the ocean. It could be really anything positive, like a positive image is a positive healing object. It can also be a positive taste or feeling. Um, he says beginning meditators should also really re try to remember that, that the powers of seeing, um, recognizing with words or prayers, feeling and believing, all these different aspects that he laid out in chapter 3, where we can see things, you know, we can see our own healing, we can envision it, we can pray for it through words and prayers, we can even feel it through different um, meditations and exercises, and then also believing that it's possible. These are the four powers of healing that he talked about in chapter three, how important these are. Then he talks about spiritual objects, which are interesting, like um, holy beings, maybe we know or we study with in this life or of the past that we learn about. Also images like uh, statues or paintings or relics, symbols, words related to a divine entity or a sacred place, you know. Um, religious people, prayers, visualizations that have spiritual significance. You don't even have to really be Buddhist to benefit from, say, a statue of a Buddha. You know, a Christian or an atheist could look at a statue of a Buddha and feel a sense of peace by the sheer visual support of that spiritual object. Then he says the third is all objects, meaning that when you're a bit more kind of advanced or integrated where you're not, you know, in duality of holy versus unholy, you can see all objects as healing 
Accomplished meditators can use any object, positive or negative, for healing. Maybe you've heard of stories of masters or uh, different people taking a simple object like an old hound's tooth or a bone or a rock but meditated on it with devotion and faith and had realization based on that. So really anything can be a, an object of healing. Um, and this is also getting towards that principle of one taste where it does things, good things aren't always beautiful and bad things aren't always ugly, but actually having equanimity and not being so dualistic around what the actual object is and that gets to subjectivity doesn't it you know what do we bring to the situation then the fourth is the true quality of the mind itself as the fourth healing object the true quality of the mind itself meaning that the natural state the true state of the mind is balanced is whole is healthy and um he says, for highly accomplished meditators, objects are unnecessary as a support of healing if the mind has truly realized its peaceful nature. Remember, I often talk about the habitual state versus the natural state. So the natural state of mind is healing, is already perfect as it is. We just have to get out of the way and let it do its job. The habitual state is, you know, neurotic, is fear-driven, is, you know, we've got karmas that we need to work through and heal, and that's okay too, but um, that's more of a habitual state when we suffer, not our natural state. So that natural state of the mind is a healing power in and of itself, a healing object. And then different sources of healing can be external things like people, doctors, medicines, other aspects of the world, divine or mundane, healers, medicines, diet, exercise, nature, and so on. But the other source of healing is ourselves. Again, getting back to that nature of the mind. And he posits that the real source of healing is the power of our own minds. So this is, we can take this as a hypothesis that throughout the book study of our time together, we can test it for ourselves. Do we really feel at the end of this book study that the mind has the power to heal? Yeah, maybe you already feel that, or maybe you still don't know. But let's take this as an open question and really engage with these practices with a sense of curiosity and open-mindedness and see for ourselves. And so what Buddhism does a lot of is, in other healing traditions as well, is to use positive mental objects as a way to rouse the inner strengths of our minds. So we'll be doing that more and more, whether it's visualizing certain things, light or energy, um, healing Buddhas like we did last time, uh, and so on. You can, like if you're a yogi, you've probably done visualization where you're imagining flowing energy or light or chakras, or prana systems in the body. That can be very healing. And so that can be a mental object as well. He says, by knowing that we all have Buddha nature, we become more confident about our inner resources we gain the ability to be more peaceful in our minds. And then he talks about, you know, what we're putting out and is what it relates to what we take in. And I had never heard this before, but um, yeah, so he says, when peace and joy awaken in us, we will see that their light is shining for us everywhere. Let me say this again. When peace and joy awaken within us, we will see that their light is shining for us everywhere. If peace and joy do not dawn in us, the sunlight of peace will hardly be able to arise from any other source. Take this to heart. This is, this is good medicine. He says, a Tibetan proverb puts it, if there is no dawn from you, don't expect sunshine from your neighbors. That was a new one. I hadn't heard that before. If there is no dawn, meaning sunrise, 
If there's no dawn from you, don't expect sunshine from your neighbors. Yeah, Nick likes that one. So praying for ourselves and others, making aspirations and offering gifts are important ways of healing, but cultivating the awareness of mental peace and joy through the four healing powers of the mind is the most effective means of healing our problems. So again, he's a Buddhist. He's coming at this from the Buddhist perspective. I really don't want any of us to come away from this class thinking that we don't have to take our medication. <laughs> okay, don't stop. <laughs> take care of yourself. But let's also explore the healing potential of the mind because like me, you probably were raised not even thinking that you could do that unless you were a Christian scientist. <laughs> but maybe that's more about God healing you. I don't know. I had a best friend in high school who was a Christian scientist. They w she wouldn't go to the doctor. It was very interesting. So Buddhists aren't quite that extreme. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I'm just saying it's not about extremes. We walk the middle path. As Dharma practitioners, we're walking the middle path between the two extremes of kind of fundamentalism and total anarchy, you know, uh, disbelief and belief, hope and fear, attachment and aversion, permanence and nihilism. We're walking between duality, between the two extremes. Okay, what else do I want to touch on in our last few minutes? He, he has a nice section on the importance of recognizing enlightenment as our true nature. So we've done a lot of that. You know, we, 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 do, we do that all the time here at the Dharma Collective because that's our main thrust. We are practicing Dharma. So we talk a lot about enlightenment, our true nature, Buddhahood, but he really reiterates how it can be so empowering for us to understand, even on a conceptual level, that we are enlightened in our true nature. We may say, such a wonderful state of mind seems so far beyond me. Why should I even think about it? Well, it's actually underneath you. It's within you right now. They say it's like traveling the world looking for riches to only find that beneath your, the floorboards in your house was buried treasure. <laughs> it's always been here. So let's see if that's true. Is that, is that true? And then he goes on to talk about near-death experiences as a way to kind of prove that in a sense that our basic foundation is goodness, is good, you know, because when we shed the body, so many near-death experiences talk about going through a tunnel towards the light, having... Um, experiences of bliss and joy beyond comparison. He says that in Tibet, yeah, he says, when I talk about enlightenment, I also like to mention the phenomena of near-death experiences. The stories people tell about what happened to them when they passed temporarily out of life are amazingly similar to centuries-old Tibetan Buddhist teachings on dying, like the Bardo Tudrol, uh, maybe you're familiar of the Tibetan Book of, of Dying, which is a misnomer. It's actually called the Bardo Tudro, which means liberation upon hearing in the Bardo or the intermediary state. So that's a really cool book if you haven't read that one. But in any case, he says, Tibetans are also fascinated by such stories and call people who have had these experiences, these near-death experiences, returners from death, delok. De means death or transcendence. Lok means to return or come back. So de lok. And there's an, a book, I used to have it, I don't know if I still have it, about a famous woman who was a de lok in Tibetan, in Tibet. Um, they weren't that uncommon. Okay, what else? So there's a lot of good stuff in these sections here. But then he says towards the end, let's finish here. It's also interesting, he says, that these experiences, this is page 55 at the bottom, that these experiences happen just at the moment when a person is passing away from the body. It is good to do what we can to maintain our health and live a happy life. But then the day comes when it is time to let go of our cherished body. Just when we stop clinging, a blissful state can arise. Maybe we can learn something from the letting go that can come in dying and apply this lesson to our behavior in life. Why wait until death to stop clinging? We can stop right now 
or at least learn to soften and loosen our grasping attitudes. That will make us happier and give joy a chance to arise in us. Why wait until death to stop clinging? I thought that was a good line there. Why? (laughs) Let's try right now. Right now, right now. So that's the end of the fourth chapter. I encourage you to get the book if you don't have it already, Boundless Healing by Tulkutunda. So we have a, few, a couple more chapters, I think, in this part one, and then part two is just mainly the meditation practices. But we've already been dipping into part two to have those experiences. So tonight we did a meditation from page um, 76. Scan the anatomical details of your body. The meditation actually started on 79. So in case you want to do that again, you can find that in the book or you can re-listen to the YouTube channel because these are posted at the end of every class. I think it takes about 24 hours for them to post, but then you can replay just even the guided meditation whenever you want to. You can close your eyes, turn off the screen, or open your eyes, turn off the screen, (laughs) and be guided in the practice, okay? So we're at time. Thank you, everyone, for your practice, for your commitment to Dharma and healing. And it was a pleasure to be with you. Please do offer Donna if you can. Um, it's a practice. It's the first of the paramitas of generosity. So even just a little bit is a wonderful kind of uh, law of attraction, you can say, or or giving so that then the energy of receiving comes your way too. It's a nice cycle. It's a good dharma practice to give, even if it's volunteering or just a few dollars. We appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. Nice to see you. And I think Eve will be with you next week. Mm -hmm. I think she'll be back, if not already, from India, from her travels. Hopefully she'll tell you some good stories. Lots of love to all of you. It's always a pleasure. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Chandra. You're welcome. Thanks to FSD, SFDC and all the folks in person um, and everybody online who helps make this happen. We are a Sangha and you can be a part of it. So you can make this your, your um, Dharma family if you like. So don't be a stranger. Thanks, everybody. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Chandra. Thank you, Chandra.